So welcome to my talk. Thank you all for coming and choosing me over whatever is on the other track. So the title of my talk is a quick look at Mac OS thumbnails. So this is basically a very high level overview of um, centralized thumbnail caches in Mac OS. So first of all, let's uh, say a couple of words about who I am. So I'm a fourth year student of cybersecurity and forensics at Napier. And the research that I'm showing today is actually my dissertation project. So it's due in a week. I'm very happy to be here. Um, uh, maybe a couple of words of how I got here. So a couple of years ago, I attended a Django Girls event. Um, I made the blog. I was very excited about making something that works. And then I started mentoring at other Django Girls events. I started organizing some uh, other Django Girls events. I got involved in the Python community. Then for some reason, I don't remember why, I applied for uh, Edinburgh Napier to study cybersecurity. And I quickly joined NUSEC where I started uh, just going to all the meetups um, that are, uh, you know, all around Scotland, all the conferences. And then last summer I interned at Zone Fox and now I'm here and I will hope to hopefully graduate soon in May, I think. Let's, let's keep our fingers crossed for that. <laughs> uh, okay, so what are thumbnails? Probably uh, most of you know thumbnails are just the miniature little images of that represent the files made by your operating system. They are there to help you navigate your files because if you were just um, supposed to remember what your files are but just by the founders, we all know that we just call everything FD, FD, FD. So like, you need thumbnails, right? So what's interesting, uh, thumbnails in, as far as I'm concerned, most uh, mainstream operating systems uh, right now, they are not only made for, for image files, as you would think, but for many other files like code, text editor files, PDFs, images, videos, obviously, and a lot, a lot of different ones. So in, in Mac OS specifically, the technology that, uh, the mechanism of making these thumbnails is called Quick Look, and it's also responsible for that cool feature that you can just select a file and then press a space tab and then you can get a full preview of, for example, if it's a PDF of a couple of pages, you can scroll through these pages, you can read it completely fine, but it's not actually opening the file, it's just a quick look at the file. So uh, just before we continue, this talk is uh, only about Mac OS. So if you are interested in Windows and Linux for comparison or just to um, just to learn something new, you can scan this QR code. If you have an iPhone, just open your camera and and um, point it at this and it should take you to a link where I put up some resources. And so if you are interested in Windows and Linux, go do that. But today I'm only talking about Mac OS. So what are thumbnail caches? They are basically directories and you will have a separate directory for each user. So that's important because it turns out that the uh, when you're root, when you're admin, you can access all the other standard accounts caches from your account. So that will be useful later, which uh, uh, I'll get to that. Anyway, how, where, are, where is this cache? So you go to var folders, then you go, there, there, there will be a random two letter string, a, if, um, um, directory name, then there will be a random long string, and then there will be a C, uh, directory and com apple quick look thumbnail cache. <coughs> so the best way to find it is just to go to var folders and find, use the find command with the name thumbnail cache from there because you will not be able to, there, there will be a lot of different random two letter string and random long strings, uh, directories. So, uh, to find it, just, just use the find command being in, in var folders. So, yeah, I'm not sure how visible that is, but it's just a directory within many other different caches there. And within that di directory, we have from three to seven files because there are some additional file SQLite files uh, being created. So uh, you can see the ones that we are interested in the most is the SQ index.sqlite database. And another one that's important, it's, fum it's thumbnails.data. So index.sqlite is a, a database which uh, 
has all the metadata about files that thumbnails are created for and about thumbnails. And thumbnails.data is ju just raw data, the, the thumbnails themselves just in a big data blob. And uh, it's really, it would be really difficult to, to parse thumbnails.data without having the index.sqlite because um, all, all, all of these images are in PNG format, but they are stripped from, from file signatures, so you can't really carve it out easily. Uh, that's why you need the index.sqlite where you have the offsets and then uh, you can uh, you can easily find where your thumbnails are. So let's take a look at uh, index.sqlite. So again, there's five tables inside that uh, database, files, pending, secure, delete, buffer, preferences, reserved buffer, and thumbnails. And again, we're most interested in files and thumbnails. So let's look at both of them, what's, what's the structure of these. And first, the files table gives us some juicy data. So we can see the path. So uh, it also often includes volume name. So the path to the original file. So in the, in the files table, we see information about the file. So by the file, I mean the original file that the thumbnail was made for, not just the thumbnail. So then file, na file name, obviously, and then FS ID, which includes volume ID and then a full stop and then a file ID within that volume. So I will show you examples in, in a bit where you will be able to see that in practice, let's say. And then in the thumbnails table, there's a lot, a lot of fields. A lot of this is, um, is used to be able to locate and uh, locate where the thumbnail is within the data blob. But the ones that we are interested in from a forensic point of view is the number of times the thumbnail was accessed. So that's the hit count. And the last time the thumbnail was accessed, so last hit date. So obviously that can give us some insight in what was done on the machine. So let's, let's think of like how does the thumbnail end up in the cache? So like we go into the cache, we view the database and we see some files, but how did it get there? What do you have to do? To make a, f to make a file, like make a thumbnail for itself. So basically, every time you, you see a file yourself, so whether it's on desktop or it is in a folder and you open it in Finder, every time you actually see that file and you see the thumbnail for it, it will be, it will be, uh, created. And also, if you open a folder, which for example has 300 images, then the thumbnails will be made for all of them, even though you'll probably see maybe 10 only because of your, of your window size. So actually all my experiments were done on a very, very not powerful VM. So if I opened a file, sometimes it would take a couple of seconds for, you know, the, the thumbnail to be created. So for example, I have had a picture and there was only like this, this white page, um, let's say thumbnail place, placeholder, placeholder. So it would take a while for the thumbnail to actually get produced. And if I was quick and just collected the cache before it, then it wouldn't, it, it would, nothing would be there yet. So um, basically when you see a thumbnail, it means that it, it got cached there. So let's look for a couple, uh, at a couple of examples. So for example, here I have a very, very easy scenario. I have two folders and both of these folders are on the same machine. So it's, it has nothing to do with networking or anything. There are there is a folder called files, and there are two files in them: to copy and to move. I'm taking the to move file and moving it, dragging it to new folder, and then I'm collecting the cache and looking at the index.sqlite. So when you look inside index.sqlite, you can actually see three records, and you remember we only had we only had two files, so. In the file name, we can see that there are two, uh, two entries for to move. One is in, when you look at the folder part, one is in files, one is in new folder. So there are two separate entries, even though it's the same file that we have moved. But when we look at the file ID and um, FS ID, where we have the volume ID and the file ID, these are the same numbers. So you can easily link, link them together and see that this is the same file, just it. Have, has been moved somewhere else. So example number two is when you have an external device and you are moving a, um, 
a file from, from the external device to your machine. So here I have USB storage, just a USB stick. There's a, a very important secret image called hacking JPG on it, and I'm just dragging it on the desktop and then looking at the cache. So here's still the file. I have two, um, two entries and in the, in the cache and both of these, obviously the file name is the same, but you know, the thumbnail can be the same for two files always, but you can see that the file IDs are different. Both the volume ID and the file ID is different because it has been moved from an external device. So it wasn't just an operation on our machine. Um, third exa little example, renaming a file. We changed the file, the, we changed the name of the file. I literally took a screenshot. If you have a Mac, you know, it just gets saved with this uh, weird name format with the, um, um, with the date and the time when it was taken. And then you, um, uh, then I changed the name to name changed. Uh, again, two entries and you can see that the file ID, volume ID and the file ID are the same. Here, that's an interesting one. What happens when you delete a file? So here I just created two uh, TXT files because based on my research, they also produce uh, thumbnails. The, the, I only put test string in it so you can't see it, but if you zoomed in really, really uh, precisely, you would see that actually the layout of the document is reflected by the thumbnail. So you can kind of see if I had a Word document with a huge picture, then you could see it in the thumbnail. So it does give you some information about what's inside. So I have two text files with test string in them. Then I put them in trash and then I click on the trash, open the trash and click empty trash so that it's super deleted, right? So then I go to the cache and what it actually did was create yet another entry in, uh, in the cache for each of the files uh, where you can see that the, the folder bit says that it's desktop first and then trash. So if you want to be extra careful and you go into the trash and delete the contents, it only increases the footprint of that file in the cache because it creates yet another thumbnail. So don't do that <laughs> if you if you don't want to be exposed. Okay, so why do we care about this at all? Why, why are we looking at, at the cache? So first of all, uh, in, it's quick be, and fast to copy because it's quite small. In my um, on my environment, like test environment that I have prepared, which isn't very powerful. It was only growing up to, uh, 500 megabytes. And when it reached 500 megabytes, it would just reset back to the start. So it would just, I know it's weird. I also, I also thought that maybe it would intelligently switch things around, but no, it just deletes itself and starts at zero megabytes again. So anyway, that's just half, uh, half a gigabyte. It's quick, quick to copy when you, especially when you, uh, when you appreciate like how much insight you, it can give you, uh, into what the user has done on the, that's what digital forensics is, by the way. Um, <laughs> um, it gives you very, very useful, um, insight in what the user has, has been doing on the machine. So obviously, um, it's much better than if you have a huge, a, a huge, you know, a, a machine with a huge amount of data then it's much, much faster to just go through the cache first. Even if it's just for triage, you can still do it much faster than try to check every file, especially when you're interested in what was done recently uh, on the computer. And also a regular user probably wouldn't think to delete it. So you would first, like a regular user would first just try to delete things, you know, just put them in the trash and then empty the trash maybe if they are super smart, but they probably wouldn't think to, to go and delete the cache. So obviously it's no, no, it's not very surprising that, um, that people, um, started researching and, and thinking what, what can be done with this. So this is very important addition to this uh, slide. So in, uh, 2000 and, um, 2018, a security researcher called uh, Wojtek Regua has, um, published a, um, a blog post about how, um, the cache can leak information from your encrypted, um, encrypted drives. So this is another QR code to that blog post if you, if you want to take a look at it. So he basically realized that when you plug in a, an encrypted, uh, password protected drive to your computer, 
and then view the contents of it and then eject it and take it away, the, the thumbnails will still persist in the cache even after it's ejected. So obviously that's a huge, huge, um, uh, security concern. So obviously a lot of people were interested in it and the, the guy is just a, um, like a master student, uh, a master student in Poland, but it got a huge coverage in different, um, like hacking news and tech radar, all these security blogs. You can see there's a lot and also, um, security forums. So obviously there was a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, pressure on Apple to do something with it and fix it somehow in the next, uh, next operating system version, which was Mojave. So what did they do? They just included, they just included, um, the thumbnail cache under their system integrity protection. So it means that basically you cannot do anything with that file. So you go into the cache and you have different caches and some of them, including now thumbnail caches, um, is just inaccessible to you. It, you cannot copy it. You cannot delete it. You cannot move it. You cannot, uh, run file on it to see what it is. Like you can't just, you have no permissions to do anything. So there is a way to, to, um, um, kind of bypass it because the system integrity protection can be turned off. You can just boot into safe mode and disable it from the terminal there. So, uh, then you, you just have access to the cache and you can analyze it as I have shown before. And even though they have fixed the, the encrypted, uh, drive vulnerability. So now when something's encrypted, you, you plug it in, you view the stuff. It doesn't get saved in the cache. Still, if you plug a USB stick in and you plug it out, which isn't password protected, not encrypted, then it persists. Still, if you are sharing a, a folder within your network, then it still gets, gets saved and persists there. So deleted files still stay there. So it's only this one thing that they thought of, but nothing else. So. Hence this slide. <laughs> so you, you may think, okay, so how is that useful? Cause I just told you that, that they have made this system integrity protection on this, on this directory. So you are not able to access it in any way. Well, you need, what you really need is the root password because after, uh, after you boot into safe mode, you need to reboot and all, and then, um, and then access obviously the, the root account again. So there is a number of scenarios where you actually do have access to, to the root account. For example, when it's your machine. So if you are an employer and, um, or for example, a new university, anytime it's your machine and you can still, uh, you can do all of these things as long as you have the main control of it. Another thing you could also think about it in a way that you can trick a person to use your computer and then be able to to uh, reconstruct their behavior based on the cache. So I have um, a, a couple of um, two, uh, actually two real life examples of, of this working. So um, I have read many, many different court cases while working on my dissertation uh, to look for something that would um, kind of touch upon this, this topic. So um, what I found is that the approaches to the thumbnail caches and also in general to digital evidence, but, uh, thumbnail caches in, in particular, they differ greatly because of lack of kind of standardized and well-researched knowledge about how they work. So instead of, instead of, um, treating the, you know, the, the fact that there is something in the cache as evidence that, for example, you have viewed, uh, or the, you know, whoever is being charged, viewed something indecent, for example, on their computer, they treat it as possession or making of this indecent, uh, contents. So for example, if there, there, there's, um, what first, um, case I'm going to talk about is the uh, Regina versus Porter. So there's a case number on there. You can take a picture and, and Google it later if you want. So basically, uh, in both cases that I'm going to talk about, uh, these are men who got charged already with, uh, with, um, possession of, of indecent, uh, images. And in this case, um, the guy had over 3,000, um, the over 3,000 thumbnails were recovered from his, from his computer showing some indecent, um, indecent content. And, uh, he then appealed to, uh, 
around two, 27, 2700 of them were uh, were um, recovered using a spe- special software which were which was um kind of um lent to uh to the UK by the US government so he appealed the charge and said that uh because you needed the special software he, like the 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 contents were not available to him because he wouldn't be able to see this 2700 photos because they were only available when you because obviously he deleted them at some point before uh they were only available using the using the specialized software and he he actually um did uh he did actually get like his appeal was granted and he was found not guilty he was found guilty of possessing other ones that were easily accessible but this one <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's like it seems funny but when you when you think about the difference if he had like 800 or you know uh over 3000 um 3,000 indecent photos, then it's a different kind of uh, magnitude of a crime, right? So he actually won that little bit, and they did say, okay, it wasn't accessible to you because you would need that special software. On the other hand, though, there was another case, um, Regina versus Christopher Brown, where the guy was found, uh, he appealed his charge as well, and um, he said that... um, the the fact that the thumbnails were on his uh, computer were because uh because he has downloaded them and he he just he said that he did not view the pictures at all so this is again if there was standardized and well researched knowledge about how the thumbnail caches work then obviously that that could be proven untrue like basing it on whatever operating system he was using because you need to view the the file for in order to for the family to be made, so uh, he did not um, he did not have uh, have his um, appeal granted because the jury and the judge have found that the thumbnails were big enough for him to be able to enjoy the content anyway. So he he was found guilty. But you can see these two cases are very similar, but still. Um, you know, still there were two very different approaches, and um, I just find that it's um, it's really weird that no one is actually treating thumbnails as evidence, which is basically what it is more than actual possessions of um, of uh, you know uh, illegal uh, content. Okay, so that's that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. I won't be quest- uh, taking questions here, but if you have any questions, please tweet me or ask me in the pub later. And all the resources and the slides later will be published at, on my blog, and this is a QR code for it. So thank you very much.